This episode of Real Science is brought to you by CuriosityStream. Sign up today at curiositystream.com slash real science and get free access to watchnebula.com. China is battling a new and rapidly spreading respiratory virus. Tonight, growing concern about a mysterious deadly virus as thousands of travelers from China are screened at American airports. The World Health Organization is holding an emergency meeting tomorrow to talk about this virus as more and more people get sick. The virus has now killed more than 100 people in China and new cases have been confirmed around the world. The Wuhan coronavirus is all over the news cycle and for good reason. Thousands of people have been infected and hundreds have died, the exact numbers increasing every day. The World Health Organization just declared a state of emergency, and they say that the global risk is now high. The outbreak started in Wuhan, China, and has begun to spread to several other countries. This particular strain of coronavirus has never been seen before by scientists. A new strain, called the 2019 Novel Coronavirus. Coronaviruses are viruses that usually only infect animals and rarely make the jump to humans. But if they do, it's bad. Coronaviruses are large viruses enveloped in lipids that contain single-stranded RNA. Like all viruses, they infect a host cell to access the machinery that the host cell normally uses to replicate its own DNA and then hijacks that machinery in order to reproduce itself, forcing the host to manufacture new viruses. Viruses can't reproduce by themselves without a host, and so they are not considered to be living creatures. They are basically just packages of nucleic acid and protein. But because viruses contain nucleic acid genomes just like all cell-based life, they too have genetic variation and can evolve into new forms. They are not really living, but too creepy to be considered inanimate either. They exist somewhere in between. Symptoms of the viral illness occur as a result of cell damage and the associated immune response. The Wuhan coronavirus usually gives its victims an upper respiratory tract illness, and for those with a weakened immune system, the elderly and the very young, it can lead to deadly pneumonia. Coronaviruses are zoonotic diseases, meaning they are transmitted from animals to people. Some of the most devastating virus outbreaks originated in bats, including Ebola, MERS, and SARS. However, direct transmission from bats to humans is rare. The jump from animals to humans usually occurs through an intermediate animal reservoir. With other virus epidemics like SARS, the animal intermediates were civets, which were being sold in wet markets in China. And the wet markets where the civets were being sold are places that are poorly regulated, where people and live and dead wild animals, like porcupines, crocodiles, snakes, and more, are in close contact. In these places, it is all too easy for a virus to make an interspecies jump. In the case of the Wuhan virus, scientists now think that the intermediary species could be the Chinese cobra, due to genetic similarity between the virus genome and the snakes. An outbreak like this is obviously alarming, but at what point does it become uncontrollable? How does a disease become a pandemic, and how can it be stopped? A pandemic is when a disease spreads across a wide geographical area and affects many people. And if it infects people quickly, a pandemic can reach nearly every corner of the globe. The Wuhan coronavirus has already made the jump from an animal host into human hosts, and scientists are now reporting that it can definitely spread between people too, and its spread is accelerating. So there is good reason that the world is worried that this could be a global disaster. To understand the likelihood of that happening, let's look back on the history of past outbreaks to see the other factors that allow a virus to wreak havoc across the globe. When you think about the major death tolls of the 20th century, you probably imagine a big spike like this for World War I and another for World War II. But in between these two wars was another huge surge in deaths. This one caused by the most severe pandemic in recent history and perhaps of all time the 1918 influenza pandemic, also known as the Spanish flu. 500 million people, or one third of the world's population, became infected with this virus, and an estimated 50 to 100 million people worldwide died because of it. The pandemic lasted just 15 months, but killed more people in a year than AIDS has killed in 40, and more than the bubonic plague killed in a century. And weirdly, it was very effective at killing young and otherwise healthy people. No one knows exactly where the virus started, and researchers are still trying to figure out exactly why it was so devastating, especially to young people. But what is known, however, is that it ticked the two boxes of what makes a truly catastrophic pandemic, 
it spread easily, and it killed easily. Part of the reason for this had to do with the particular state of the world at the time. Crowded conditions and the movement of troops definitely played a role in the spread of the disease. Healthcare workers were also spread thin because of the war, and there were limited ways to treat a viral infection at the time. The world was still a long way from the antiviral medications and vaccines that can now help to stem the spread of a virus and promote a quicker recovery. So today, with better living conditions, standards of hygiene, and modern medicine, this level of devastation can be avoided, right? Well, hopefully, but not necessarily. While different conditions exist today which help make a pandemic less likely in some ways, other things make the risk even higher. As the world's population grows, there is a greater possibility someone will encounter a virus that will spread to others. And as people are traveling greater distances today than ever before, and in larger numbers, viruses are able to spread more rapidly. This factor, in particular, is what has everyone in such a panic. 17 years ago, the world contended with exactly these threats in a similar virus outbreak, also in China, SARS. SARS stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome and is a viral respiratory illness also caused by a coronavirus, called SARS-associated coronavirus. In 2003, over the course of a few months, the illness spread to more than two dozen countries. It was characterized by high fever and in most cases led to pneumonia. SARS spread by close person-to-person -person contact through respiratory droplets like a cough or sneeze. A total of 8,098 people worldwide became sick with SARS during the 2003 outbreak, and of these, 774 died. It proved difficult to contain, made worse by several mistakes and bad choices by the Chinese government, showing the world that factors beyond just the science of the virus determine how bad an epidemic will be. When SARS first sprung up, the Chinese government withheld information about the epidemic from the public and vastly underreported the number of people that had been infected. They severely downplayed the risks and took several months to establish travel restrictions. With little to no information being reported from official Chinese outlets, people had to rely on rumors and access to foreign news. Many credit the severity of this outbreak to the government's deception and inaction. If there had been prompt and accurate reporting of the full facts so that others could have taken preventative measures, fewer people may have died. But even with these unfortunate circumstances, SARS was eventually contained, and a total global disaster was averted, once enough quarantines, travel bans, and treatment was in place. The question many are asking now is, has China learned its lesson, enough to mitigate the damage this time around with the Wuhan virus? China is claiming to crack down on withholding information. A Central Political and Legal Affairs Commission account said, Anyone who deliberately delays and hides the reporting of virus cases out of his or her own self-interest will be nailed on the pillar of shame for eternity. The World Health Organization's Director General also praised China's quick response this time around. But some experts suspect that the true number of people infected with the virus is still higher than is being publicly reported. But the Chinese government does seem to be taking it seriously, mandating that face masks be worn in public places in some areas, and imposing strict travel bans in several Chinese cities, attempting to quarantine millions of people. Urban buses, subways, ferries, and long-distance passenger transport have been suspended in Wuhan. Passenger cars, however, have not been blocked from leaving the city, so how effective a ban like this can be is not fully certain. But even with these actions from the Chinese government, they are only reactive measures. Some reports say that 5 million people left the city of Wuhan before the ban was imposed. Once the virus is out in the world, it is very hard to stop. More cases are popping up each day in different countries around the world. And very unfortunately, scientists are now reporting that the virus can be spread in its incubation period, before symptoms appear. Someone may have no idea that they have the virus, spreading it far and wide, before they even feel sick. All of the action being taken now is trying to close the Pandora's box that has already been opened. We can only hope that the measures being taken will be enough to keep this from going from bad to worse. In light of epidemics like this or SARS, ultimately what China needs to do is some soul-searching about the state of the wild animal trade in the country. On January 22nd, authorities in Wuhan banned the trade of live animals at the wet markets, but this is too little too late, and in all likelihood not permanent. 
The death toll is rising, as it did with SARS, and in both cases, it all started with the poor regulation and trade of wild animals. Whether or not this will become a global pandemic is ultimately in the hands of the Chinese government and public health officials. As some experts have said, one nation's weak response could endanger the world's public health security. Many say that a global pandemic is the biggest single threat, other than a nuclear war, to the health and economy of the entire world. As epidemics like the coronavirus or Ebola seem to crop up every few years, understanding them is of the utmost importance. You can learn more about the spread of diseases and the impact that they have by watching Viruses, Destruction and Creation on CuriosityStream. CuriosityStream is a streaming platform that has thousands of high-quality, high-budget documentaries. In Viruses, Destruction and Creation, doctors, virologists, and scientists examine the spread of the Zika virus, what effect the disease may have on large populations, and possible next steps to stop the illness, things that are relevant to all virus outbreaks. And, to make it even better, your CuriosityStream subscription now also comes with a subscription to Nebula, the streaming platform made by the best educational content creators, like Wendover Productions, Thomas Frank, Minute Physics, and our other channel Real Engineering. Nebula is a place that allows creators like us to make exciting and original content, without worrying about the YouTube algorithm or demonetization. There are new episodes being added all the time, like Real Engineering's new episode of the Logistics of D-Day series, which tracks the strategy of clearing a path through the defense forces for the Allied troops on D-Day. So if you sign up using the link below, you'll get access to all of CuriosityStream and all of Nebula for just $19.99 a year, and be supporting a community of creators that love making new and exciting content.